So welcome to our panel about the public data, ESG and credit risk global. So we will have two parts. Uh, so one is really to discuss about the public data and the other is about ESG. And we have, um, I'm very proud that I have members of BIAA uh, on, on the stage and as well via video. Can we, can we bring him on video, Kausha? But in the meantime, so what I would like to um, introduce first BIAA or Business Information Industry Association. We are a global association for consumer and commercial credit bureaus and as well as uh, for related industries like RegTech and also more and more FinTech, uh, also in the context of the regulations and open data. So there is a close relationship. So we are providing a neutral platform for our members uh, to network, to discuss to common topics. Uh, we are doing as well and supporting, we are, industry, we are doing industry advocacy uh, towards regulatory bodies. And there is, as we can see, a lot is going on on data topics and as well as uh, on ESG topics. Uh, a big discussions around that. Also, uh, we have one of the largest source of information about our industry and uh, for our industry, where we can really deliver what's going on in, in the industry itself and as well as uh, giving value to our members uh, on, on topics which are impacting them. But before we now discuss with the first part, so I really ask you, um, ah, we have already polls. That's great because it's very important to include your votes um, to our topics. I have then to remove my glasses to really can see uh, what are, where are the highest votes so that we can start a discussion on this. But before we are going to do this, I ask you to introduce yourself. Uh, so Anton, maybe we start with you. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, hi, my name is Anton Masad. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cedarose. Um, I've been in this line of business, the business uh, information and data since uh, 1991, so it's like 32 years. Um, our company is, uh, the, has the largest database of information on corporate entities for the Middle East, Africa, and emerging markets. I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity, and thank you, Ingrid, for organizing uh, this get-together from these experts that we have. Thank you. Giorgio. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here today. Um, my name is Giorgio. I work at S&P Global Market Intelligence. I'm not a rating analyst from S&P Global Ratings, so I just put this disclaimer. My team develops statistical models to assess credit risk of corporates and SMEs, and more recently we have linked it to ESG and climate change considerations. Gertjan. Yeah, uh, thank you. My name is Gertjan Kaart. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I work for CreditSafe. I have uh, same as Anton. Uh, uh, that's why we have the same hair uh, piece. Uh, long history in this uh, industry, so hopefully we can answer all the questions that uh, we expect. Hello again, uh, my name is Georgios. I do a similar work of business as Giorgio. Uh, I work for CRIF, for the credit rating agency, one of the two of the group, for ICAP CRIF. Uh, so my, uh, my role is as head of analytics and methodologies to develop uh, models uh, prob most, most uh, in corporates of uh, credit risk, and also now going to the ESG assessment, which is a great challenge. And thank you for joining this panel short term, very short Thank term. you for, for the proposal <laughs> to be in this also. So but now first you can relax the first 30 minutes around, so uh, before we come to the topic. Kaushal, I cannot see, ah, ah. Kaushal, hi. <laughs> hi everyone, uh, this is Kaushal Sampath from Rubix. Uh, I'm on holiday currently. The only risk greater than credit risk is the risk from an angry spouse. So I didn't want to take the chance and disrupt my summer holiday. Uh, but I am uh, pleased to be on this panel. I've spent about 25 years in the credit uh, risk information industry. First at Dun & Bradstreet for about 18 years, uh, where I led the India business. And now uh, as founder of uh, Rubix, which focuses essentially on creating, which we built out a risk platform for credit supplier and compliance risk uh, for companies in, in, in India and around the world. Uh, been involved in setting up India's first credit bureau, 
India's first uh, rating agency for small and medium enterprises. Uh, I'm very excited to be on the panel today with all these experts. So thank you, Ingrid, for inviting me. Thank you for joining the panel here. So let me set the frame first uh, about the availability and quality of public data, so the con conditions we are in. So statistically recorded, statistically recorded, we have around 334 million companies around the world. From there, we have 45,508 being German precise, because you can hear I'm German. They are stock exchange listed. And there are, according to the World Bank, 416 million micro and small sized enterprises around the world, and thereof 230 are informal. So that's the lens, so that's the environment uh, we are working in. On the availability and quality, um, we have different settings and on regulations and standards on public uh, data globally. So there are, because I was looking in the preparation how many uh, registrations and register types we have, I can say there are 19 somehow common relevant registers from several hundreds. Just to, to, to name some of them, so it's company register, ultimate beneficial owner register, insolvency register, company and security register, sanction list, and so forth. From 195 countries worldwide, nine do not have any legislation or in preparation or they are planning something to do that. And important is that the quality of the public data depends on a proper quality monitoring by the public body and related, related fines. So just to point one of the issues uh, we might, might discuss. Further, we have, uh, it has been mentioned already in one of the panels, uh, we have the very high dependency on digitalization. So we could see uh, during the pandemic situation um, that in some areas or in some countries, so the registration or the information provided to the registration interrupted because there was no digital solution available. This changed over the pandemic period. One of the lighthouse uh, country in the world, which is really very uh, advanced, so it was New Zealand, so on the other side of the world, they have uh, online public registry since 2008, so everything worked properly. Coming from these conditions, and now let's have a look at um, our votes, what we have now. Maybe we can show it again, because it's important. I cannot see it really, so okay. We have um, on a complete list relevant, of relevant information, so um, yeah, there, is, there are challenges, the uh, timeliness, yes, and less it's interesting about the availability. So let's, let's start with our going around the globe, looking exactly at this uh, votes about the completeness, correctness of, of the uh, information or relevant information. <coughs> so when we look at Europe and US, so where do you all see the biggest challenge which you have to cover? So being able to provide information for credit risk decisions yeah. to uh, customers. Well, the, the, the very first, challenge basically and that's a challenge that that we all face in the information industry is that there's not one single source of truth the 400 million something companies that you just mentioned yeah. are not in one database they are spread across the world and it has been mentioned before, it's not just spread across the world. The language problem is not a problem. Technology is not a problem. The problem really is the governance uh, and the organization in each and every jurisdiction or each and every country uh, that you have to face. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk about Europe here, mostly maybe, and we say Europe is one single market, the EU. It's nice to have one single market, but it would be very much nicer for us 
if we would have one single Chamber of Commerce registry, uh, which is something that we talk about for 30 years something, I would say. Uh, and I think we will talk about it for the next 30 years, mm -hmm. simply because there's a lot of politics involved in that one as well. So the simple fact of the matter is that uh, in order to do the first, the very first step into what everyone does here, uh, is to identify even a company is already a challenge uh, because it's different in each and every country in Europe. And then go to the United States, for instance. It's one country, but it is not, obviously, because in the United States, even worse, there are no unique company numbers. Of course, you have our big friends and, uh, in the US, Dun & Bradstreet, with the Duns numbering. And so every company makes their own uh, numbering system, same uh, for, for CreditSafe and others. But in each and every state, there are 50 states or so in the United States, companies can file and register in different ways, even with different names, still the same company. And that is fine, because I can keep talking, but it's also a challenge in, in Europe, because when you want to identify IKEA in Antwerp, for instance, IKEA NV, mm -hmm. something like this, uh, probably, does it also show IKEA Stockholm, uh, which is clearly Connected. So can we even, we're talking about UBOs, but can we even identify ultimate parent companies uh, in, in our registry? So this is the big challenge, and obviously the information industry, us as CreditSafe, but many of our friends and, uh, uh, and colleagues, uh, this is the value that we provide, I think, to be able to to have one single database to identify in the first place the bias in your, in your, in your databases, or yeah. customers, or debtors, mm -hmm. or stakeholders. And when it's with regards to the content, so when I w would like to do a credit decision, so I want to see a balance sheet, uh, I want to see payment behavior, and so yeah. forth. I want to so, yeah. yeah. So because that's my expectation, so let me say I go to a public regist uh, register, online or not online, and then I see I'm looking for a balance sheet. So I can either not find a balance sheet or I can find a balance sheet, mm -hmm. or I can find only some, uh, let me say, key financial yeah. uh, information. Yeah. So how, what, how are you managing this so that at the end we're managing you the, deliver a, a, a risk evaluation? Yeah, but we're managing the reality, which means that if in one country there is a regulation to file annual accounts in one certain way for certain companies, we use the information. If in other countries it's different, it's different. So this is the previous speaker in the previous panel. It was said uh, the same kind of statement. It's not about the data. We can process every single piece of data. Mm -hmm. It is really about the, the harmonization of the regulatory landscape across the world. This is very different. So this gives us uh, the, 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 this is the source data that we talk mm -hmm. about. There's one question maybe just already, because obviously our industry uh, uses, uh, as an example, the annual accounts, the financials that are officially uh, published yeah. or filed. So can we also look at alternative data then? Can we calculate revenues or turnovers or profit margins or, or, or stuff like that? Well, we can. We can calculate this, especially now with machine learning and stuff like this. It should be quite easy to even calculate the UBO, for instance. But is that data still good accurate. enough and yeah. accurate mm -hmm. for, uh, for our customers? Does it give you a lawful basis to reject a customer? Uh, so we are working with can, officially I, I can found imagine, So um, if you uh, uh, use, let me say, mimic data mm -hmm. for, uh, as a part of the credit as a risk assessment, so uh, it's a little bit difficult, I, I guess. Yeah, for, for it is for, for us and also for the people that, that, that our customers, the users, it's important always to be able to uh, explain your decision. You can go to the counter of, uh, yeah. of a car leasing company and say, sorry, computer says no. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so th it doesn't work like that. Maybe the computer is right. Uh, yeah, you, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, can you, uh, you know, deny mm -hmm. uh, certain companies or individuals access to 
finance access to credit. And then the regulators step in again, because there is a law about uh, uh, access to finance. Yeah. Uh, and you can't just reject uh, yeah. companies from, from accessing finance. So. When I look now, so we discussed now, let me say the luxury situation that we want to have a standard <coughs> across Europe. Now I'm coming to your region, to MENA region, but there are some other situations, I would say, it's much yes. more challenges. Absolutely, challenging. yes, and many of them. Let me just put into yeah. perspective what is known the MENA region, so MENA, M-E-N-A. Uh, it's an abbreviation for the Middle East and North Africa, so it's, um, for everybody's knowledge, it's a collection of 19 to 21 countries, um, quite diverse collection of countries, actually, and it spreads from the Atlantic, from Morocco, all the way to the Yemen. Uh, we have uh, various languages that we speak in those places. The population of the region is in excess of 500 million, so it's about the size of the EU, mm -hmm. with a growing economy and growing population as well. Um, and it's very diverse in terms of economics, so we have countries that have fantastic GDP and even have surplus GDPs and we have countries where they have inflation at 200% like Lebanon for example. Um, when it comes to data dissemination we have few things in common. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things are the lack of transparency. So the challenges of obtaining good information is actually the lack of transparency. Some countries are not transparent at all, others are a little bit transparent and some are quite opaque so they don't provide a lot of information, they don't disseminate to the public a lot of information. Some good ones uh, for disseminating information are like uh, Saudi Arabia, recently the UAE, uh, Oman, Jordan, Morocco, uh, one of them. Some of the bad ones could be like um, um, Yemen, Syria, uh, Sudan, mm -hmm. uh, these, Libya as well, some of these countries. Not to mention Iran and Iraq because of the difficulties there. Um, there's also the lack of uh, centralized data. So there's no centralization of data, even on the country level, let alone on the region level. So you have countries like the United Arab Emirates, just like the United States, it's a federal government, seven emirates, seven different registers of commerce for those emirates. And in some of those emirates, that's 40 or 50 free zones. So it adds on to the jurisdictions to add. So some people say they cover the world, where they say it's 230 jurisdiction, 240, 220. It's because there are multiple jurisdictions for offshore. Uh, company incorporation. And there's also the lack of um, uh, infrastructure as well. So when it comes to data and to technology for both of them. So for the technology, there are some countries that are very much behind on uh, um, automation, for example. So the systems are not up to date. Mm -hmm. They're not online. They are not centralized. So that it makes the information collection and provisioning of that information very difficult in nature because the data itself is outdated or it's decentralized, or it's uh, fragmented, or not standardized, and so on. We have um, language problems as well. So there are diversity of languages used officially. There, are, there is the because Arabic. If I, if I, I interrupt you, so, so mainly, so we have our same written languages so across Europe, more or less. So, but in, in your market, it's also different. Absolutely. Arabic, it ought to be the official language of yeah. those countries, but some countries ought to use like official business languages. Yeah. So you have uh, places that are francophonic, they speak French, so French is the official language for business. Mm -hmm. So the information is centralized or collected in French language. Mm -hmm. Others could be purely in Arabic. Some could be in Arabic and Kurdish to add to the flavor. Um, and then if, to present that information to the clients and to the end users that they can make sound decisions from, it has to be unified and standardized exactly. and uh, also in one language ideally, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so so this is some be. of the challenges. Yeah. And of course we have uh, lack of financial information. There is no filing of financial information requirements for many reasons uh, across the board with the exception of one or two countries. Uh, that's primarily because Governments didn't ask for that information. That's because there was no tax uh, systems in place or there isn't still tax systems in place. And um, even if it is filed at the government level, it's not publicly made available. I'm talking about private companies here. Publicly listed companies, yeah. this is something else is available like anywhere else in the world. Uh, so that adds to the challenge too. So how do you create the information for your customers? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Listening at all these uh, okay. obstacles, because it sounds, so we, in Europe and US, so we are in a 
good world, even if we have uh, problems with regards to the quality of public data. But in your case, it's even worse because the problem of quality of public data is a minor one from what I realize now. Yes. So how do you manage this? It's, 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 a, it's, a, big, uh, it's a big challenge, <laughs> I must say. It wasn't an easy one. Uh, at our company, for example, we invested in it since about 10 years ago into the collection, standardization of data, translation, transliteration, mm -hmm. conducting entity resolution to unify the records to link records, to mm -hmm. add histor historicity to the records as well. We did it ourselves. Such information is not even available at the register in some instance. Yeah. Like, uh, we'll give you some numbers. We have uh, maybe 1.1 1, 1 .1 million companies in Egypt on record. That's a small number compared to the actual number of companies in, in Egypt. There ought to be about 4 million. Yeah. But in one place, centralized and in a standardized format in English, we have more data than the Egyptian government has in one place. Oh. as a private company, oh. just to give you an indication. Yeah. So it's a big process to do this. So for, for the end users, I can suggest for them to use multiple sources, reliable sources, or one reliable source that knows the market, knows the region, come across all these challenges and overcome them for them, basically. And how do we ensure the quality then? Because uh, from what you said, the diverse landscape um, that it or let me try, uh, ask it in another way. Are there situations where you have to say, we know <coughs> that the company is existing, but the, there are no data available? Yeah. yeah, we can come across this. We've actually, uh, for instance, some countries like, again, Egypt, where yeah. uh, the process is manual and it's paper-based at the government level. They, they, we have inspected records physically to extract company information, and there were pages missing or information missing as well. So that comes down to data governance or good uh, solid uh, models in place for data processing, data management, and data quality monitoring at the government level. They kind of realize the, uh, in the region, I'm talking in general, the importance of having good data because they know with good data comes good decision. And they need decisioning okay. for uh, improving econo economies of the countries mm -hmm. and so on, and inclusion in the world trade as well. So there are efforts there to improve that kind of quality okay. at the government level, but it will be a journey. It will be some time if you, before we see the actual fruit of it. Uh, in the immediate time, we have some countries that have taken really strong measures to conduct this and to enable this. But there is the language barrier still, like Saudi Arabia is becoming unified through a central registry, but it's in only in Arabic, and it's, uh, it's on a single entity. Nothing is linked there. And the UAE is working progress. It's been announced recently, so over the next year or two, we will see some initiative coming into place and into practice. Because we have, as well, looking especially on UAE, when I, when I look at digitalization, so, and then on the other side, uh, how can I make uh, decisions when we say B2B marketplaces and everything? So, uh, if the data are not available or they are manually still uh, put yep. together and then at the end automatically assessed yes. uh, for the risk. Yes. So, they have to rely on credit bureaus or information providers, otherwise it's yes. not going to work. Absolutely. And in-house also clients or companies or end users can utilize human resources to also help them in collecting information, mm -hmm. analyzing information, getting it in the native language, translating it. Um, and also to do telephone calls and interviews, especially for trade references, like I was mentioned yeah. earlier. And the lack of financial information, the next best thing is payment behavior. Yeah. So also doing that. Plus relying on technology for benchmarking company information. If you have data on, say, 50 companies in the region that are of similar size, yeah. you can benchmark and start create like sort of uh, kind of uh, guesstimates on certain mm -hmm. companies. You can use uh, technology for uh, predictive analytics and predictive of failure and so on. Plus, you can also be part of technology-driven sort of data uh, repositories and data reciprocity kind mm -hmm. of initiatives that are uh, also available. Yeah, that's, that's very important, I think. So this means when I compare uh, Europe and uh, US yeah. with, with MENA, so still some stuff needs to be done before we can discuss about and can complain about the quality of the Absolutely. data. Absolutely. Bring all the challenges of Europe and the <laughs> USA, put them together, and we have more of them in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> now we are coming to a, to a completely other continent, uh, country, so it's India. India is for, for me or for all of us a, a market about analytics, because analytics is, is, is one of the top topics there. 
And India is as well a very fast growing market and becomes more and more important, important uh, when it's about trade. So Kaushal, so we are so happy you having you here. So uh, to you the same question because uh, you are now the biggest country in the world when it's about the population. And I realize there are an, a lot of regulations are, are going on. So there's a lot of speed on your market. Um, so um, what is the situation now when it's this, uh, collecting the data from the past and when we are looking now? So what is the outlook uh, under, under these new circumstances? Right. So I think, uh, you know, like Anton they uh, said, you have to look at public companies and private companies, incorporated entities where you have a registrar very differently from proprietorship and partnership firms. India is still a largely proprietorship and partnership family business driven country. Uh, the bulk of our GDP comes from SMEs, small and medium enterprises, and they are the heart of the country. They're what makes the country grow uh, both uh, uh, financially in terms of employment, economically, etc. The challenge in India has always been getting information on them. And that is a historical reason because they are not required to file their documents with anyone other than the income tax department. And that too, there are restrictions in terms of size. So if you're below a particular size, uh, you don't file. And that's why you will see a lot of Indian families uh, keep opening companies, keep starting companies uh, because they want to stay below that size. It's the same thing for goods and services tax, which has been very helpful in terms of data. It's probably been the most important thing that the government has done uh, but even there, if you're below a certain threshold, you don't need to obtain a goods and services tax number. And that becomes a challenge. So I think for India, if you ask me, the single biggest challenge uh, is essentially to get financial data on proprietorships and partnership firms who make up uh, the bulk of the country's uh, uh, companies. And for that, at least at Rubik's, uh, what we do is we, are, uh, as Gurdon mentioned, uh, as Antoine mentioned, analytics becomes, and as you mentioned, analytics is the key. So we use estimation models and benchmarking models uh, to give us the size of a particular business to, and to uh, create a pro forma p uh, a pro forma profit and loss account, which gives you the GP, which gives you a pro expected net uh, profit margin and the approximate size uh, in order to, uh, you know, give us uh, uh, some information about the entity. Uh, the other challenge that we have is a deduplication challenge. Lots of entities uh, with similar names. We have over 30 states. Uh, every state, you can set up a company uh, and have a, the similar name, especially if it's a proprietorship firm. You don't have to check with any single source. If you're a Incorporated entity, you can't get the same name. But if you're a proprietorship firm, say Kaushal Traders, there can be hundreds of Kaushal Traders in the country. So deduplication, uh, deduplicating that, coming up to that one golden record about that entity, uh, adding information about the family, the promoters, the proprietors that own it uh, is very critical. And that's why knowledge, local knowledge uh, becomes extremely important uh, in a market like India, Ingrid. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. When we look at, at the part of uh, on the quality then of the models, because you said you are doing uh, estimates, so how they are accepted uh, within the credit risk assessment as well. So I'm not sure, I, I'm, unfortunately I don't know whether, the, so you are, there are credit insurance companies there as well. So uh, how, how do you manage this situation because uh, Credit insurers to have the same uh, situation uh, when 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 it's with regards to company data, and on the other side, they are using the reports when we come to the unnamed uh, area, so that it's proved once there is the risk evaluation X. So then, fine, we accept this. So how do you manage this with the credit insurance, or how they are accepting this, or? So Ingrid, that's a great question. And credit insurers or bankers or any lenders, 
uh, you know, anyone who provides straight credit insurance will want to check your model against the probability of default, right? So you have to do a lot of probability of default modeling. What are the defaults that have hit a database of say, you know, we have 2 million businesses on which we built the model. Uh, like you said, India is the largest uh, country in terms of population. So we're also one of the largest countries in terms of number of businesses. So we use one and a half million records to build out uh, our probability of default model. We looked at 256 industries and sub industries. And we said, what is the probability that this company will default based on similar parameters, et cetera. And we have a team of PhDs and you know high-end analytical uh, analysts uh, who uh, focus on uh, credit analytics uh, in order to do that. What we do is once we've done the probability of default modeling, we present those findings to credit insurance companies. Credit insurance companies in India are also working with the same challenge. They have zero data on, on any of these entities. So they're happy doing credit insurance for the larger companies, uh, but the SMEs, which are critical, uh, are left out. So when they get the probability of default models and they see and they see their own experiences over time, uh, they begin to accept the models uh, in certain industries. There are certain industries they won't touch. For example, gems and jewelry. It's a high risk industry. The, you may have the best model in the world, but they will not touch it. But if you look at retail, if you look at agrochemicals, if you look at chemicals, you look at steel. Uh, they are willing to accept those models in the absence of anything more. Um, and again, you build in, like An Anton said, you bring in data from social media, you're bringing in bankruptcy data where available, you're bringing in very importantly check bounce. Uh, so we have all court data. And that's something that we uh, we uh, bring in uh, onto the table into the model. Uh, is there court data? How serious are the court cases against the company? Uh, we capture every court case in the country from the lowest to the Supreme Court. And you get that and you package this all using alternate data. What are employees saying about the company? What are, uh, are their salaries late or on time? You see a lot of that on social media now, on Glassdoor. People are talking about all our companies, right? So we go and we mine that and, and based on that, we come up with the risk score and we come up with the estimates. And on that basis, that the insurance companies, banks are willing to accept uh, to a, a very large extent, I would say. And so far, our journey has been very good. So we've been right from the beginning, we've been digitized and we've been cred credit analytics focused. That's been our approach. We don't want to uh, follow the standard Let's do a site visit. Let's try and do all of that because that's not scalable in a country like India, which is why we set up Rubik's in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I listen, but as you said, we are using social media. So for me, as a European person, uh, with and other countries who are having a regulation like GDPR, so it's like <gasps> so we are not allowed to use it. So this means. So you have, you have the uh, uh, availability of other sources you are allowed to use uh, within your regulation. So that's, that's uh, a good topic on one side. On the other side, so I have to say this as well. So um, yeah, it's about data ownership, but it's another discussion. So here it's, it wouldn't be possible uh, uh, to use this kind of data. Yeah. So just one, one point, Ingrid, data privacy uh, looks at the data of an individual, right? So we, have, we are getting data privacy legislation. Our law goes into effect yeah. uh, in July, I believe. The issue is not, if you're looking at aggregates of data, metadata, you're allowed to use that in your models. Uh, so, you know, that's the smart thing to do, that you're able to use aggregates rather than a specific. So there's a workaround. It's not as effective as knowing everything about Ingrid because I can't know it. But if I can know something about people in your town, uh, people in your socioeconomic strata, uh, you know, I get some aggregates. And on that basis, I build a credit profile. Uh, and that credit profile then can be used uh, to score uh, your risk. So I think that's the approach that our industry will have to take in some sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you to MENA region because I'm very familiar, we are very familiar with Europe. So as a last question to, to this public data topic, 
Uh, how is it with the use of social media information or the metadata around this in, in this area? Okay. Um, it's again like uh, Coach Ross said as yeah. well uh, on, the, on the individual's data. I mean, don't forget in the first instance when an individual put their data on the media, on the public media or social media, they have actually published that information themselves in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So we're not getting information that is not publicly available mm -hmm. in the first place. Secondly, within line, there's a separate discussion that can be on data protection and GDPR. Yeah, it's it's all about um, you know, purpose of the information, yeah. usability of it, access to it, yeah. and you know, how and why and for what purposes and so on. I forgot so, to mention this uh, limitation as well on the on, on yeah, this frame yeah, setting. Uh, yeah. in, in our region, it's actually working against us as well as data providers because there are now strict data protection regulations yeah. when there's still no public data available on the corporates and information on the companies. So they, they are restricting it in that way as well. Um, but we didn't cover China as well, so China could be another region which is similar or nearer to, to us and our region. I have some information on it which tells us that the information in China today is, uh, well, we are faced with three main challenges. The first challenge is on the uh, government control over the data, what can be controlled, what can be dis disseminated, and, and so on. Two, the regulation and data protection is quite uh, strict, so mm -hmm. it makes it very difficult to whom you can obtain information for what purpose and to share that information, including corporate information and financial information, which can be considered as private. So you need to get the person's uh, or the company's uh, consent to access mm -hmm. that record ah. and that information. Ah. So this is similar to this kind of uh, uh, So it's topic. even more strict as, as, as we have in Europe. Yes. Yeah. And you have the language barrier because it's strictly in Chinese, so no government website is available in, in English, for example, to get that information. Um, so it's quite challenging to obtain, uh, but they do have centralized data in one place, and it's accessible in one place in Chinese but language. But you have to ask. Uh, not only there's some public uh, data points that are available to the general public, but mm -hmm. not directors and shareholders of information mm -hmm. of companies or financial information on those companies. Those mm -hmm. go behind after the consent, mm -hmm. basically. Um, which again is similar to other countries in Africa, but it's paid walls. You have to pay to access that kind of level of information. Oh, like South yeah. Africa and Nigeria, yeah. they have that information available to the public, but behind paid walls. Ah. Um, so you have to pay and subscribe. That, that's, an, that's an interesting model, yeah. yeah. I'm looping in now. Unfortunately, we have to stop the public data discussion. We could continue with a lot of stuff, as you can, as you could feel, maybe, from our discussion. And I'm coming into the direction of ESG. When we took, when, and I pick up now the topic SME, where we don't have data. So there are some lights on the horizon, thanks to ESG. Let me say it like this, even if, if it said like, okay, there are tons of regulations, data are around the world, uh, they are, uh, not structured, uh, I don't know how to use it, but with regards to ES SMEs, there is already something available so that I can enter the data, but it's not really public. So maybe I, I, I say your name in English, George. George, yeah, George. George, George, George yeah, George. It's, it's the same. The so same. Uh, there, is, there is something uh, around uh, what... Yes, yes, correct. If, if I can get one minute to share my experience on the business information public data for, for the area yes, that we are. Um, <laughs> uh, we have, we have the, the luxury to also have a business information unit. So yes, uh, sure. we have presence in uh, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Romania, and Bulgaria. All of, all of those are European countries, but they have uh, different uh, problems regarding those data as they were pointed in other places of the world. For example, in Cyprus, uh, there is no obligation on public uh, financial data, so we have a database of 150,000 corporates which are active, known active, but there is no data. So it's, it's a cultural thing about the, the, uh, the essence of, of, of companies to, to come forward in terms of trade to publish those data. Uh, same issues we have in Greece. The regulation is not uh, imposing uh, to file financial statements only the, the tax authorities have a simplified uh, um, profit loss statement, mm -hmm. but published uh, financial okay. statements are for the close to 50,000 companies out of 500,000, which is the ecosystem of, of companies active in Greece. Mm -hmm. The other way around, for Romania and Bulgaria, 
uh, all companies are obliged to file. Uh, the, um, they do uh, file in an automated way, uh, so the data are there publicly available. So in the same area, the Balkan area, we have uh, two different mm -hmm. uh, set of pictures on mm -hmm. this. So to close well, yeah, this, this issue. Yeah, it's, to it's very, as you said, getting at the beginning. So even if we are Europe, it's so diverse, but we are in a luxury situation looking uh, at MENA. So I, I really need to admit here. So. <laughs> <laughs> So therefore, yeah. uh, but now I'm looping in, so we have to yes, stick to the time, yeah, yeah, looping in. So to the SME, so as I said, there is a light on the horizon uh, with reg where ESG is supportive that we can, th that data can be collected or data are collected anyhow. So maybe you have some words on this, what's going on around. Yeah, yeah. we, we as CRIF uh, are trying to uh, uh, have what we call an ESG data lake. So mm -hmm. we gather information using business information to calculate ESG data needed for the companies that are not, uh, uh, let's say, putting out there on the market either in terms of compliance in reports they produce or other because they are not obliged to do. So uh, we have uh, built advanced analytics uh, using sectoral uh, benchmarks to complete this data, which is not available for mm -hmm. a company level information. So as you understand, this is an ongoing process since our, our database is getting stronger and stronger and validated uh, after we have also um, uh, digital platforms that could, uh, that, that, that can, let's say, um, uh, give those data and validate those data back. Uh, so this uh, has to do with the, with the, the involvement of, of the ESG, let's say, acceptance from the company, from the companies, uh, and but this is an initial step to, to help the companies that uh, do because not have it, data. it will be a little. It's too, it's my impression, but it's not just my impression. It's a little bit underestimated. Look at it around all the regulations. So it had been mentioned today the uh, supply chain act, especially so from the Germany. But I have to say there will be an even stricter European one by the end of the year. So, and for this, this kind of information is necessary. And then, looping in now, Georgia, to you, when we look at uh, the assessment, so uh, there are ESG scores around from different uh, information providers or rating agencies. Uh, they have uh, ratings which are different. Uh, everybody, so there is no regulation so far in place. And then we have on the other side the credit rating. So uh, I'm lost. So I'm, as a credit manager, I would be lost. So what, what is? The suggestion here, how oh, to navigate yeah. to this world. So, yeah. Thank you for the question. OK, <laughs> no pressure here. So um, I think it's, it's a very relevant one. We, we can see there are many companies offering ESG scores, uh, very different. I saw recently even a Twitter, uh, on Twitter a, a comment by Elon Musk saying, oh, it's unacceptable. Tesla got a rating of a very bad rating from the S&P Dow Jones indices for the ESG part. And uh, tobacco companies get much better ratings. Well, first of all, I would say we need to caution this. So ratings is a strict word that we use only in the context of S&P Global Ratings. And we talk normally about scores. Then the second thing is, to your point, definition of ESG. What does it mean, ESG? And even if we had an exact definition of ESG, let's say it's the best company in the world that complies with all these things. How do we measure these things? Do we use a relative measure in relative terms, as we do, for example, on the S&P Global Dow Jones Indices side, just by ranking companies in the same industry against each other? And then Tesla can be the best one in its own industry, but still worse than a tobacco company relative to its own industry? Or do we do it in absolute terms? And this is something very critical. If we want to do it in absolute terms, we need underlying data. Data quality is something that Yorgos was mentioning just before today in the morning, standardized. They are not standardized. Uh, coverage. We have, uh, for the rated universe, uh, only 4,500 companies that are rated by S&P Global Ratings. What about all the other 334 million plus companies that we have in the world? How do we do it uh, in a quantitative stem from a quantitative st standpoint? I think uh, I've been probably a bit um, um, 
use the tool, what we have in our company, I don't want to do a sales pitch, but we have Sustainable One, it's a division of S&P Global uh, that does collect information, for example, on the E side, on the environmental side, on the emissions of companies. Scope one, scope two, now they are working on, on a model for... So what uh, is scope one quantified. and scope two? Because we are, we have no Lost clue. That. Okay, so scope <laughs> one are the direct emissions of me as a company in the uh, normal operations. So whenever I produce something, I basically consume, say I'm an oil and gas company. I'm producing actually emissions, CO2 emissions related to the operations, direct operations. Scope two are the emissions coming from the fact that I need to heat my buildings and I need to consume gas and electricity. Scope three are the indirect emissions coming from my supply chain. So mm -hmm. I may be an oil and gas company that is dealing with another company, I don't know, in the food uh, uh, industry, and the food industry is actually using uh, plastic wraps. Those are scope three emissions. These are very critical because it's very hard to quantify. On the other side, I would argue that it should be, in my opinion, if I were a regulator, less of a concern for the simple reason that the scope, my scope three emissions, when I deal with some of you, are your scope one and two. So provided, uh, you as companies try to reduce your own emissions, the scope three emissions that I, maybe I'm financing as a bank should decrease naturally and uh, virtually, so to speak. Reality is that uh, regulators are asking about uh, reporting, no? TCFD reporting, uh, it's uh, the, the, the task force for climate related financial disclosures, then you have TFND, so task force for uh, another nature related financial disclosure, so you keep seeing more and more evolution of these things. My point is that we have, even if the definition is clear and what we want to measure is clear, say emissions, we have another challenge that is how do we measure these things correctly? I make an example. Now, in a few minutes, we are gonna go for lunch. You're gonna have a coffee after lunch. Do you know what is the carbon footprint of a cup of coffee? I did it actually, I checked actually on chat GPT because it's very cool, no? <laughs> and, uh, and the answer was actually quite stunning, no? I also did it old style, you know, Googling it. Uh, what is the carbon footprint of a cup of coffee? Between 20 and 40 grams of CO2. Is this a lot or is this a small amount? No, it's not. Except for one detail. Every day, two billion cup of coffees are consumed every day in the world. You multiply by the number of days in a year, you arrive to 100 megatons of CO2 emissions. If this was an atomic bomb, probably my ex-colleagues from Russia, uh, because I'm an ex-physicist, by the way, they would tell me that they could wipe out completely the United Kingdom in a few hours with a tsunami with that coffee. is 30 meters high, 300 kilometers, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> because of coffee? No, no, certainly not because of coffee. But this is um, just to show that, is this a lot or is this not a lot? The problem is that 100 megatons are based on certain assumptions and estimations, but we don't have a clarity about the complete uh, um, flow, uh, the, the complete chain and flow of these emissions. Even companies that report these things, sometimes they rely on their own estimates of what they think to be what they are consuming and producing. So definitely, I welcome a lot this uh, kind of um, um, regulation to try to make things more transparent because ultimately we need to link it to credit risk. Yeah. And sorry if I keep blabbing about it, but I think Credit risk, so how do we do it? So we have the ratings side, we have the, uh, so many scores. We have the S&P Dow Jones indices with VSG component. I don't want to comment too much about it, otherwise I get fired by my government. But yeah, but in general, I, I would say that uh, it's, uh, it's, there are so many scores. We have the ESG scores from Sustainable One that just look at the sustainability of a company. Then we have, and this is what I welcome a lot, the ESG credit indicators. What is material for credit risk purposes? And this is exactly what we need, and this is what in my team we use from the rating side. We take these ESG credit indicators, material for credit risk, put them in our statistical models and try to, with uh, you know, advanced techniques like Yorgos was mentioning before, to cover the remaining companies that are not rated. But this is not the end of the story because then on the east side, regulators are asking, okay, but yeah, you have the assessments of today. What about in 30 years from now? What about the transition to greener exactly. technology, all these things and physical risk, you know, bread and butter for, for insurance companies? And there is, I think, another crux to the point, and then I stop <laughs> blabbing, so stop me. <laughs> but I, stop I get excited about this. It's, um, we need to we, um, okay. do all this kind of uh, scenario analysis. No? The regulators are asking, do scenario analysis over 30 years. As an ex-physicist, I would say, this is rubbish. And uh, I, I wonder why regulators want to look, uh, uh, in particular, so far away in time, 
when in reality, um, especially looking at uh, estimations that are done looking potentially at the full financial statement of the company. How realistic are those financial statement, pro forma financial statement uh, forecasts or estimations over 30 years? We cannot already predict what's going to happen next year. So Imagine over 30 uh, yeah. years or so. And uh, just to conclude, what we use normally on our side, quantitative models, uh, bottom-up analysis. We say, okay, if the carbon tax in the next 30 years increases by $1,000, say in a certain country for ton of CO2 emission, then we can calculate what is the impact on the cost of the company, the revenues, and we can try to do a bottom-up analysis. Is this back testable? No, because this is the first time we have ever started to do this transition to a greener technology. But what we can do, and I would, uh, if I were to speak with the regulator, I would tell them uh, very um, wholeheartedly, I guess, is that it's important to remember that apart from what we know about the uncertainty about the future, and we can use scenario analysis to do this, no? to try to understand what may happen in future, there is another uncertainty that is related to model risk. Bankers, insurers know very well about this. What assumptions have been made in the use of this data to arrive to an estimation? This is why we don't have in our company one single quantitative model to assess the potential implications of uh, climate uh, risk on uh, credit risk, but we have two actually, that use different uh, assumptions that try to gather for maybe smaller companies where we don't have the information. We know that it is very hard to collect them and they are not standardized. We need to cover with uh, benchmarks uh, other estimations and maybe one more advanced for companies where we have a lot of information, but there are so many assumptions anyway that I would say use them both and compare the outputs and get uh, comfortable, I embrace the uncertainty of the outputs of these two models. Stop. That's okay. <laughs> like a but it's okay. So this gives us a lot of insight as well that there are, what are the issues uh, around while uh, rating agencies are really trying to serve the customer oh, yeah. and, and uh, to give the information. But still for me, so now the last question, because Griff has as well the rating agency, for me it's not clear credit ratings and ESG ratings. Is it or will it be the case that the credit rating will be disappear under the ESG rating? No. Or well, do I have to have two ratings? Because as information providers as well, well or as a rating company, do I need to have the credit rating and ESG rating? I think that, that the need is to have two ratings because they tell a different story. Uh, the credit rating refers to what is the probability of mm -hmm. default in credit events. Mm -hmm. And the, as Giorgio very well said about the, the tones of different scores that are, are there out in, in this uh, industry, which is unregulated, with different definitions of what they predict and different ways how they mm -hmm. do it and what they measure. Uh, that's what I was going to say. So a credit rating, uh, and we do statistical modeling, especially in Europe. We have all the, we have all the data available. Uh, so you typically look at the default definition. And uh, in this room, if you look at uh, credit management in challenging times, it's, we assess millions of credit decisions every day based on our the scorecards and the, the, the scores that we use, all of us use, and we provide as an industry. Um, ESG, if and that's something that we have not yet established. This is also yeah. uh, what has been said before. We don't know uh, on the short-term trade credit decisions what is the impact of, a, of an ESG score. We don't even know what the ESG score is. So does ESG scores uh, have a, an, an influence on the credit worthiness, short-term credit worthiness of a customer, of a buyer? Yeah. That is the big question. I still believe, like it's, with you... It's, it's a tricky question to answer, if, if, I, if I may yeah. finish. Yeah, uh, so, so it's basically we need, for, to make credit decisions, you need a credit score. The input to the credit score potentially can be uh, your, your position in the, in the ESG ranking, because today it's still mostly rankings, basically, what you do. But is a company with a, with yeah. a very good, high, green ESG score, paying their bills in a better way than a company with a low score? That is your question in this room. Yeah. Ingrid. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a good thing that, that you mentioned this because it has to do with uh, everyone's perspective regarding the ESGs about the, the environmental, as, as I said. If I can 
trick the question other way around. If I told you that my model has excess materiality on the credit risk on the G factor on your industry, I could predict the, the probability of default easily. Yeah. And I could show the correlation of that because, for example, as I said uh, earlier in, in this, uh, in, this um, uh, in a previous panel, uh, different sectors and locations for the companies have different materiality uh, uh, connections regarding the, the, the credit risk of, of the ESG criteria. For example, an impact on, on the food industry, uh, uh, food safety label could harm the, on, not only the reputation, but could have uh, short-term financial losses yeah. in terms of sales decrease. And this could uh, sign up. Uh, and also uh, regarding fiscal destruction, fiscal risk. But as long as the ESG is not in the, our default definition, which is default of payments on short term, whether it's a bankruptcy or another uh, default, if you don't put it in our default definition, the credit score will not tell you anything about the ESG position, unless, okay. the, unless really, if you drink a lot of coffees in your company, you start to pay your bills in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a better or worse way. Or it becomes the chief not of ESG, so we don't in, know. In, no. Yeah, Kassel, Ingrid. yeah. So, yes. yeah, one uh, last point, uh, uh, and t it's yours. Go on, okay. come on. Yes. yes, so what I did want to <laughs> say was there is a risk uh, especially in emerging markets, about using ESG ratings uh, as greenwashing. Uh, essentially, uh, there are lots of supply chain heads and procurement people all over the world, in the US, in uh, the developed markets, who are buying goods uh, from emerging markets and who need to, in some sense, uh, tick the ESG box. Uh, and there are always going to be uh, you know, agencies uh, you know, which are, you know, dubious, which are not uh, reliable, not like SNP, not like Griff, you know, they're fly by night, who are issuing ESG ratings left, right and center and saying, I've got a great, you know, you've got a great ESG rating. That ESG certificate gets sent into a supply chain somewhere in Europe and the manager says, okay, let's go and buy it. And they're complete, utter rubbish because those companies are polluting, they're using you know, child labor, they're doing everything, uh, you know, which, 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 is, which should not be done. So, in fact, in India, we've had this issue and the Securities and Exchange Board, which is the regulator for all listed entities, has said that no one in India is allowed to now issue ESG ratings and they will not be recognized unless it's a certified credit rating agency and there are certain objective criteria that are put in there. And those objective criteria, as Gurdjian said, can then be linked down the line into some kind of credit default, etc. So regulation of ESG ratings is an industry, I mean, is imperative, uh, because otherwise you're going to have an industry develop without any kind of oversight, which could create huge problems. Thank you. Unfortunately, so you can, you can see that we are very excited about what we are discussing. And finally, as well, about ESG. And ESG, there is much more to talk about. But let me summarize. So we have, we have discussed at, at the end, so when it's about the public data information, so we have areas in the world where there is availability, which is luxury but the quality is not good enough, so we have to mitigate. Or we have areas where we cannot, uh, where we don't have information at all, so we have to mitigate as well. So that's, that's one part. And we have very different uh, situations, or very different countries, where we have to mitigate most of everything. Yep. So really being able to provide uh, very trusted information. And then we have the ESG topic, where, I can, where, where we identified also during the day, there are a lot of open points. So we are trying as an industry or the industry is trying really to be very close to regulations or uh, influence the regulations so that we can come on speed so that you as a credit manager can really use it step by step in a trusted way to fulfill the obligation you will have uh, in the next, no, it's not very near in now and in the future. So thank you very much on my panelists. Thank you for being available from across the world. Kaushal, I wish you great holidays. Thank you very much thank that you. you made you available. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.